in our journey through the letter of Paul's to the church there at Ephesus. But I, as I've always shared with you, and I want to remind you that these letters, while they may be addressed to a certain church, whether it's Ephesus or, or Colossians or Philippians or, or wherever, let me assure you that these letters to these churches can apply to us to today. Amen? We can not only apply to our, our own church right here at Grace Baptist, but we can apply it to any other church in the United States and around the world. We can not only apply it to the church itself, the, where we come together and meet and to worship God, but we can apply it to our own lives as well. Several weeks ago, we talked about putting off the old nature, and getting rid of that old sinful man, and putting on the spiritual nature. And we talked about putting it off and, and putting on that spiritual nature, and what we mean by that is Christians, we don't walk like we used to walk. Amen? We walk differently. We don't talk the way we used to talk. We talk differently. We don't act the way we used to act. We act differently because we've taken off that old nature and we've put on the new spiritual nature of Almighty God. So with that in mind, today as we continue on, we're going we're gonna to look at this message this morning and it's titled, What Grieves the Spirit of God? And this morning, we're going to look at three things about the Holy Spirit. But before we get into the message, I just have to share this with you about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third part of the Trinity. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit, we teach and we believe that the Holy, Holy Spirit is not an it, as some would refer to the Holy Spirit. He is not a ghost, as some would refer to him as. He is God's Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. He is eternal, and he possesses all the attributes and personalities and deity, and that he is co-equal with the Father and the Son. That's what we believe. We believe and we teach that the unique work of the Holy Spirit is in this age that it began at Pentecost. And he came here from the Father as promised by Christ Jesus himself to initiate and to complete the building of the body of Christ. You are the body and I am the body of Christ Jesus. We're getting a lot of feedback. We teach and we believe that the Holy Spirit administers spiritual gifts to the church. Now who's the church? Are these walls of the church? No, brother. It's us that he endows and he gives each and every single one of us spiritual gifts that we are to use to further the kingdom of God. And that the Holy Spirit has never once, nor will he ever, glorify himself or any of his ministries or any of his gifts. His job and his purpose is to glorify Christ Jesus. That is what the Holy Spirit does. We believe and we teach in this respect, that, the, that God, the Holy Spirit, is sovereign in, in, in the bestowing of all his gifts for the perfecting of the saints, that's you and I. That is what we teach, and that is what we believe here at Grace Baptist Church of St. Genevieve about the Holy Spirit. A lot more I could say, but I had to say that about the Holy Spirit. So this morning, we're going to look at three things about the Holy Spirit of God. The first thing I want you to notice is this, that there is what's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, beloved, there is a sin that is unforgivable sin, and it is this sin called the unforgivable sin or the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that there, are, there is a lot of confusion out in the world today and even in Christianity about, well, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Have I committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Have I committed that unpardonable, that unforgivable sin? What the unforgivable sin is, what the unpardonable sin is, is for a person to constantly and ultimately say no to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
That is the unforgivable sin. Rejecting faith in Jesus Christ. That's unpardonable. Whatever other sin there is, God can forgive you and will forgive you of that sin. Amen? And those sins are forgiven. But when you come to the point in your life when you are about to breathe your last and your heart is just in seconds away from stop breathing, if you have not accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, that is unforgivable. That will send you to hell. All right? So, in saying that, if you are a born from above Christian, if, you had, if there was one point, one point in time in your life where you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you did it sincerely from a full heart saying, Lord, I'm a rotten, no account sinner and I can't do anything good and I ask you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior, forgive me of my sins, to take control of my life. If you have done that, you are saved. All right? Don't let Satan or any of the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it preachers on television tell you that you can lose your salvation and your sins are unforgiven. Because if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. No questions asked. So just put that in, that, put your mind at ease. Put it at rest. Ask yourself this question, did I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? You may not remember the actual day, the actual month, or the actual year. You might know say it was spring, or it was summer, or boy, it was fall, or it was winter months, and I was out on the banks of the river fishing, and God just pressed on my heart, or whatever. And I pray to receive Christ. Put it down as a marker. You are saved. Now, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are condemned already. And you are headed for hell. I can't say it any nicer than that. Or I can't say it any easier than that. And the Bible even tells us that you, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you may be in danger of committing the unforgivable sin by not accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. So remember that. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The second one is the quenching of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, it talks about the quenching of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. Now, don't answer out loud. I don't want to know. Don't poke your husband or your wives or, you know, the person next to you or don't look over across the church. But think of this for yourself. Have you ever felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to do something that Christ would want you to do, that God wanted you to do? Maybe it was just to call somebody and say, Hey, heard you haven't been feeling well. I want you to know we're praying. I'm praying for you. Whatever the case may be. I saw you the other day in the store and you looked a little down and I just wanted to call you and encourage you. I hope you have a great day and trust in the Lord. And the Lord will lead you today and guide you today. Have you ever had those things in your life where you felt the Holy Spirit leading you to do that? And then you just said, oh, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time. They don't want to hear from me anyway. Have you ever done that? Well, folks, listen. That is quenching the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is trying to tell you, call that person. You may be a, an instrument, you may be a vessel in their lives to help them, and you're saying, nope, I don't have time. God, I just don't have time. To give an example, it'd be like you have a fire and you, put, you take a bucket of water and you pour the water over the fire. That, beloved, is quenching the Holy Spirit, amen? You just said, nope, can't do it, not going to do it. The third thing is grieving the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, there are several ways. And, and we're going to take the next few minutes and we're going to, we're going to spend some time at, talking about, about grieving the Holy Spirit. The first way we grieve the Holy Spirit within us is when the truth is not communicated. 
That is what Paul says in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in our text. And I want you to stand with me now. See, you thought I was going to go over that, didn't you? Oh, no, I was waiting. Stand with me, please. And turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's begin with verse 25. Paul writes, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil opportunity. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with, with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. In verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for this text of Ephesians 4. We pray, Father God, that you just lead us and guide us now. Speak to our hearts. We've laid the foundation. Now speak to our hearts about grieving the Holy Spirit and help us not to do it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, Paul says there in verse 25, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, therefore, lay aside what? Falsehood. Lying is a is pandemic in our society today. Did you know that? Many of us in, in our own lives as Christians, and, and including myself, and I feel bad about it, but we have cultivated a skeptical distrust attitude when we're talking to somebody, don't we? We just don't believe people anymore. And we've seen it from our top government officials all the way down to the lowest. From our co-workers, our neighbors, our, within our own family. And we feel like we just can't believe what people say anymore. We have come to a point in our lives and as a society that we just feel and we just think and believe that everybody out there is just lying. That you cannot trust hardly anybody anymore. And when you do find somebody that you can trust, you're just overwhelmed by it. But that's talking about truth. Let truth be in you. Let no false un, uh, falsehood come out of your mouth. I remember when I was a kid, and believe it or not, your pastor sometimes would do things that he was told not to do by his mom, and I would do them anyway. And she, of course, like all moms, she found out about it. I don't know how, but she always did. It always worried me when she was doing dishes and I would stand behind her and she goes, I can see what you're doing. I thought, does she have an eye back there? You know, if I part her hair, will there be an eye back there and she's looking? You know, but you remember how mom said that? You probably said that to your kids. I see what you're doing. But I remember I would do something wrong. And my mother would look at me and she'd say, Bruce, and boy, if she said Bruce and then my middle name and my last name, I knew I was in trouble. She'd say, did you do that? And she'd say, and I, I remember she'd always hold up that, her little, and I'm, I'm saying this very respectfully, her little short pudgy finger. And she'd say, now remember, if you tell me the truth, you'll be disciplined, but it won't be near as bad as if I find out you've lied to me. Yes, Mom, I did it. And of course, I'd be disciplined. You know, but I remember one time in my life, I thought, man, the discipline's going to be worse, and, you know, so I'm just going to lie. Maybe she won't catch me. Well, how many of y'all have older sisters? Man, they will tell on you in a heartbeat. And my mom looked at me and she said, did you do that? And I said, no, ma'am. And she said, you're lying. I thought, I'm caught. And I said, you're right. I did. Can't lie. Sorry. Yes, I did it. She said, why'd you lie? I don't know. I'm dumb, I guess. She said, you're going to be in trouble now for not only doing what you did, but for lying to me. Whew, that taught me a lesson. 
I don't care how bad it was from that up point off. And mom said, did you do that? My answer was, yes, ma'am, I did. I think sometimes I said, yes, ma'am, I did, even when I didn't. Because I was just afraid. <laughs> but let no unwholesome word be in your mouth. Tell the truth, even if it means not sounding good. Tell the truth. We also, we grieve the Holy Spirit when our temper is not controlled. Paul wrote there in, in our passage in verse 26, Be angry and yet do not sin. Now, folks, I know that anger can be a righteous anger. Amen? We've all heard that. And it can be directed wisely. I think about the time as one just small example. I think the time that, remember when Jesus went into the uh, temple? And there were the money changers and they were ripping each other off and lying to each other off. Remember, he got a little upset. I'd say it almost went to anger. And he made the whip and chased them all out. I think that was a little bit of an anger thing. But it was what we would say a righteous anger. He didn't hate the people. He was just angered at what they did to his father's temple, of what he, they did to his father's house. But for the most part, anger we see today, it is sinful, it's hurtful, and it's destructive. And let me say this so you'll know whether or not you want to come to next Sunday or not, under the inspiration of the Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit and God willing, I have taken that verse where it talks about that, about anger, and I am going to take the time of that one verse and, and, and preach a whole message on it, on anger. Because I believe there's a lot of people that are struggling with anger. I really do. I remember when we lived in Texas, there was a counseling company. It was named Men the Minneth and Meyer Clinic. Some of you may have heard about that. If you live down south, it, it was a well-known counseling center. And they coined a phrase, and that phrase was used to describe someone who was always losing their temper, always what we would say had a hair trigger temper. And the word that they coined, the phrase that they coined, was a rageaholic. This person is a rageaholic. They go into a rage. And, it's, and it meant for somebody who just lost their temper at the drop of a hat. They boiled over, say, so to speak, at just the least little thing. Now, some of you listening may, may be a rageaholic. Some of you may live or work with a rageaholic. And whether you are a rageaholic or you know somebody or you work with somebody or you live with somebody that is a rageaholic, that person, the non-rageaholic, lives their lives and their whole entire lives walking around what we call on eggshells. They are just so afraid that anything they say, anything they do, anything they don't do, anything they don't say may throw the rageaholic into a terror. And so they walk around on eggshells. We all know the destructive power of anger. And like I said, we're going to talk about that next week. But for today, let me ask you, what are you going to do with your anger? If you have anger, you may not have any kind of anger except for when you get behind that steering wheel. Man, I know some people like that, don't you? Man, they get inside that thing called a car and they shut the door and they strap themselves in and they put their hands on the steering wheel and they turn on the ignition and they take off. And it's like, man, they've gone from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. You know, and, you're, and if you're a pastor in the front seat or the back seat, you're just praying the whole entire way. Well, some people, when you ask them, what are you going to do with their anger, some people will say, well, just repress it. You know, we hear that a lot, don't we? Just repress it. Just hold it back. Well, I'm not a counselor and I'm not a psychologist, but I know enough in life, I've been around on this whole earth long enough, that I know that is not the thing to do. You don't repress it. You don't just hold it back. That'd be like taking a trash can full of uh, paper and light it on fire and then putting a a lid on, uh, halfway on it and stick it in a closet. You're still going to have a fire, amen? It just may smolder and it may just 
take a little bit longer, but it's finally going to ignite and it's going to burn your house down. Well, when you go to repress things and hold things back, that's what happens. You do that too long and it finally explodes and then it's all chaos. Some people will say, well, you no, know, you don't repress it, you express it. You've heard that, right? You might as well say it as to think it. You might as well do it as to think it. Well, that's like explosions that hurts other people. And beloved, that's not the answer either. It's really not. Because it can be very detrimental to the people around you. So if the answer is not repressing it, if the answer is not expressing it, then what is the answer? Here's the answer. Confess it. Amen? Confess it. Confess it, uh, confess it before God as sin and ask Him to give you control over your violent temper that you may have. You may be thinking, well, Pastor, I can't control my temper. No, it's not that you cannot control it. It's that you, you will not control it. Because in any given situation, you can control your temper. Person X just makes me so mad I just lose control. It has nothing to do with person X. They may be negative. They may be a grumble bug. They may be, you know, as negative as all negative can be. But it's you or I choosing whether we allow person X to get us angry and lose our temper. Right? It's us. Verse 27 tells us, do not give the devil an opportunity. You remember we talked about that last week or two weeks ago. And let me tell you something, folks. A, an, a violent, uncontrollable temper, what it does is it gives the devil a place in your life where he can operate in his strategy of misery in your life. When you become angry and you start having all kinds of thoughts and you lash out, what you're doing is you are just allowing Satan to have an opportunity to come into your life and just cause total chaos in your family. It's like opening the door and just saying to him, come on in, Satan, come into my personality and stand firm in my life. Whenever you lose your temper, you're like opening the door and saying, devil, come on inside and just destroy my marriage. Destroy my relationship with me and my wife or me and my husband, me and our, my kids. I'm giving you a place to stand. And that is why Christians ought to control their temper. Amen? Because we're instructed by the, Holy, by the Word of God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God not to give the devil an opportunity in our lives. Number three. We grieve the Holy Spirit when theft is not condemned. Now, you may be thinking, now, wait a minute, preacher. I may tell a little white lie every once in a while. But like I've always said, a lie is a lie is a lie. Amen. There is no such thing as a little white lie or the big lies. You may even be thinking, now, preacher, you know, I, yeah, I, I'll admit I lose my temper every once in a while. But I am not a thief. I don't steal. Are you sure? Have you ever padded your expense account in your business? Folks, that's stealing. Amen? Got kind of quiet. <laughs> Amen? Amen. If, you, if you pad your expense account and you turn it in to your employer and you say, I've done X, Y, and Z and A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G, and you've only done X, Y, and Z, you're padding your account and you're getting paid back for something you didn't do. That's stealing from the company. I want to ask young people. Some young people would say, well, I've never stole. Have you cheated in school on a test? That's stealing. That's stealing. Have you ever, and boy, here's where I'm going to get it. Have you ever given false information on your income tax return? 
So you get just a little bit bigger of a return check. Well, now, I know that our federal government and I know our state government waste a lot of money. And I think everybody in this congregation would say amen to that. But if you give false information on your tax return so you will get a bigger return than what you truly deserve, then folks, that's stealing from the government. Have you ever been in a store and the clerk by an error has given you back more change than what you deserve? And you knew it? And you just said, that's my good fortune, my good luck. Bad luck for them. I know they've got an answer for it at the end of the day when they do their checkout and all like that, but oh well. It's an extra dollar or two in my pocket. Folks, you're just stealing. Malachi in chapter 3, he says, if you're not tithing, you are robbing God. He says, at one time or another, all of us have been thieves in this area, and that is why the Bible says, he who steals must steal no longer. A thief must be condemned. There was a big study done by the American Psychological Association on what is called inventory shortage. Have you ever heard of that, inventory shortage? What it is, the American retail business, at the end of the year they take their business and their inventory, what they have left comparable to what they bring in. And more times than not, what they have left over from what they have brought in, what they have left is, is a lot less. Okay? And this American Psychological Association conducted this study and they found out that the shorty comes from three different areas. 10% of the shortage was the result of just a bookkeeper's error. The bookkeeper has gone back, looked over the numbers again, and said, what? Wait a minute. I blew it. Should be this. 30% 30, 30 was due to shoplifting. Now that's 40%, right? 10 and 30 is 40. 60% came as a result of employee's theft. 60% of the employees are stealing from their businesses. Stealing is a real problem, and as Christians, we cannot live a lifestyle like that, of being continually deceptive and stealing. That's why in the Bible it says sharing is better than stealing. Amen? That is why the Bible says in verse 28, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with ones who has needs. Now, there's a lot of people out there, and they have needs, and some people choose not to do anything so they can to, to get things free. But there's also a lot of people out there that they don't have anything, and they're doing everything they can to, to make a living for themselves and their families. And we need to help those people, amen? We need to reach out and help them. The Bible says when we as Christians encounter someone who has needs, it is better to share than to those, for those who have a need. That's why Jesus said if you have two tunics or if you have two hats, give one and you keep the other. And we share with one another. A Jewish rabbi once said this. He says, the man who does not teach his son to work teaches him to steal. Now as Christians, we are to be faithful employees and faithful workers. We must be faithful givers. Number four, we grieve the Holy Spirit when, we talk, when our talk is not clean. What do I mean by that? Well, look at verse 29. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. The word unwholesome is from the Greek, and it is a word that describe, describes rotten fruit. That was only good to be what? What do you do with rotten fruit? You throw it away. You know, also rotten fruit does what? If you, have you ever picked up a rotten apple or a rotten tomato and stuck it up to your nose and smelled of it? Doesn't smell too good. It stinks. That's what Paul's talking about here. The Bible says that that is the kind of vocabulary that people uses. 
Some people call it filthy language. Some people call it cursing. And filthy language or coarse gestures or coarse verses, words or unwholesome words, they're described in a couple ways. One of them is profanity. We all hear profanity every day, don't we? You cannot go into a store or turn a television on anymore without hearing all kinds of profanity. I had a real good friend of mine, a brother in the Lord, that uh, was discipling me when we lived in East Texas, and he lived out in West Texas when he was growing up as a kid. And he told me the story we got on speaking about profanity and how people, now this was back, mind you, back in the uh, middle 80s, how profanity was on television. And you think back to the middle 80s, it wasn't nothing compared to what's on today. But I remember Howard telling me, he said he remembered being a young man and he went to see a movie called Gone with the Wind. He said the movie at first came out and he said, man, he wanted to see about it because it was about the Civil War. And he said the whole theater was jam-packed with all kinds of people from out in that hometown of his. And he said the movie was going along great and it was a good story and good, you know, conversation between this character and that character. He said, but then it got to the point where Clark Gable as Rhett Butler in the movie said, frankly, my dear, and we all know the rest of the line, he said you could verbally and hear a gasp of air from the people in the theater. And he said some of them got up and walked out and said, if that's what movies are all about, I will not go to another movie. Now you compare to what Clark Gable said in Gone with the Wind to what you hear not just in the movies today but on your television today, all I can say, and I say this sincerely, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. We've gone that far as a society. You let a person growing up in our society today watch Gone with the Wind. Well, first of all, they, they'd be bored to death. But you let them get to that part where old Clark made that statement and they'd, they'd just brush over them. They wouldn't even hear that. It wasn't even red shirt. And you could look at him and go, did you hear what he said? What? Let me play it back. And you play it back for him, And they go, so? We have let that kind of unwholesome words become such a part of our society that even those words are nothing. Profanity. Unwholesome words. The second, in the Greek, what they're talking about here and what we see in our, in our Bible, in our verses, is criticizing. The phrase unwholesome words not only means profanity, but it also means the kind of talk of criticizing someone or tearing someone down that you damage them either emotionally or spiritually. Now, you're all my age or a little bit older, a couple are a little bit younger, but you've also heard the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones. What's the last part? But words will never hurt me. Right? Isn't that what we always said? And it would seem like we always said that when we were on the playground. When somebody would say something to you. And <laughs> we'd always put our hands on our hip like that really meant something. And you go, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Right? Isn't that what we did? But I'm here to tell you this morning that a lot of times words that we say to one another hurts us way deeper than what those sticks or their stones would do. Because you can take somebody and hit them with a rock or you can take somebody and hit them with a stick and they'll eventually heal from that and they'll get over that. But I know people that have had things say to them back when they were teenagers and they are now in their 50s, 60s, and 70s and whenever something comes up, that is the first thing they remember. And that is why they don't reach out to achieve things. Words do hurt. The Bible says, let no unwholesome, our modern words today, rotten speech come out of your mouth. If what you're saying and what I'm saying is not there to edify somebody, to build them up in the Lord, 
and to encourage them, then folks, I'm just going to put it plain as plain can be. Keep your mouth shut. Amen? Now, yeah, sometimes we have to say, hey, if somebody comes up to me and says, Brother Bruce, now I want you to help me in this area. And I hear them saying this or I'm saying that, and I, you know, they've given me permission, I come up to them, but I do it in a loving way, and I say, hey, brother, not good words. Or maybe you should have thought a little bit different before you did that. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But if I look at that same person and go, well, you stupid idiot, how dumb are you? Are you crazy? And on and on and on and on and on. That's tearing them down. We have enough of that in our world today. Well, let me encourage you this morning. Four things from our text, really. To always tell the truth. Control your temper. Do not steal. And talk clean. But now, if you do any of those four things, we've got a praise report. Almighty God can and will forgive you if you ask Him. Amen? The good news is the Holy Spirit of God is in love with us and He will, will forgive you if you ask Him to. And He'll cleanse you from all of that. God loves us, but he wants to, us to walk with him in obedience and to live for him. Amen? Let's pray. Well, Father God, we come before you. And Father God, I just pray that you just speak to our hearts and you lead us, you guide us, Father. Help us to be your people. Help us to walk in a way that's worthy of you, O oh Lord God. Help us, Father God. We know if we're saved, we know we cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We cannot do that impardonable, unpardonable sin. But Father, help us not to quench the Spirit. If God is, if your Spirit is, is showing us and speaking to us to do something, then Father God, help us to do it. As long as it gives you honor and you glory, Father. But Father, help us not as Christians, help us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Help us not to grieve Him. Father God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will grow in us and that He will be such an example for us and that we will live for, for, the, for the Lord God using the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us through the Father and through the Son. Now, Father, people would love to be around us and love to listen to us and that they'll know that they can trust us, Father God, and that we will do what we say. Forgive us when we don't, Father God. Forgive me when I don't. Speak to our hearts, Father God, and lead us as only you can through your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand with us. And turn in your hymnal to page 243. We're going to sing one verse, I guess it'd be, of sweet, sweet spirit. And he is a sweet, sweet spirit. Amen? Amen. He's not a ghost. He's not an it. He's the Holy Spirit of God. Third in the Trinity. Let's sing to him.
count. And I'm counting two down here, and I can't even count that many up there. And you're trying to, I don't know if you're trying to convince me or yourself, but you say that there's more of us than there are of them? Look in verse 17 of 2 Kings. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Okay? And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There's that spiritual realm. Until the servant guy got plugged into God, he couldn't see it. Once he got plugged into God, and through Elisha's prayer, I'm sure he was sitting there going, oh yeah, there's more of us than there are of them. There's that heavenly realm. Paul the apostle, same thing happened to him. Write this verse down. It may be in your, in your outline, but if not, write down 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Read that sometime. It's another one of those great heavenly realms where Paul was plugged into God. Well, that's the sphere, number five. That's the sphere of, of blessing. Now let's look at number six, the security of the blessing. How secure are your blessings? It's interesting for those who have, who have invested, you might get a, a, a statement at the end of the month, every six months, whatever, and enlist all your securities. All, all the stocks and bonds and investments and, and, and T-bills and all that other stuff. And I kind of get tickled because, and I kind of have to chuckle sometimes when people say, well, all I got all my investments, and they're in this and that and, and the other thing. Folks, listen. I hope and pray those are not your investments or they're not your securities. You remember what happened in a uh, date called 1929? There was a thing called the stock market, market crash. And these men and women that put all their future, all their money in these T-bills and investments and stocks and bonds and all that, they lost it all. They lost all their securities. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to buy stocks and bonds and T-bills and all that stuff. I'm not saying that's wrong at all. But don't let that be where your securities are. Your securities are in Christ Jesus. That is where your securities are. You can lose all that other stuff. And yeah, it'll be hard. Yes, it'll be difficult. But your security in Christ Jesus is still there. Don't put your security in heaven. Now, don't be shocked. Let me explain, okay? Don't put your security in heaven because I know some people who think that right before they die, they're going to be able to jump into heaven. The door slams behind them and they go, whew, made it. No. Don't put your security in heaven because what happened? We said this a little bit earlier. Some of you may recall it. Remember back when Satan fell? when he said, I'm going to do this, 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 and all these other things, and he was so conniving and so convincing that he took a third of the heavenly angels with him to hell. Or that's where they will be one day. Okay? So don't put your security in heaven. Put your security in Christ. He will never fail you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Paul uses that term or that phrase in Christ in, in, in not only in Ephesians but others of his writings many, many times. In Christ, that term, that phrase means the blessings we receive are secure only in Jesus Christ. They're not secure in heaven as much as I can't wait to go to heaven someday. My securities are not in heaven. They're in Christ Jesus there was a long-time missionary in China. 
She had been there before China went over communism, and she had been there even after the communists took over, and she was somehow allowed to stay there. And she taught there for almost 100 years. She was a little bit over 100 years old. And I got to watch her video at a, at a convention that I went to, and, and it just, I just have to be honest. I remember that when I was starting to do this sermon on blessing. I remember this. And it just blessed my heart then, and it blessed my heart to remember it. Because she talked about being in Christ. And she quoted John 14 and verse 20, where Jesus said, In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. She talked about that. And in the video, here was the way she, she taught that. She used what, what they call an object lesson. And her object lesson was a, uh, a flannel board. You remember those? And, and on that flannel board, she had a big box with a top on it. And, and the box had a sign on the side that read, God. God the Father. And she opened the box. She had it fixed where she could open the box and she pulled out another box with the top and on the side of that box it said, Jesus. Then she would pull open the top of that box and pull out a smaller box and it said, me. So you had box number one, the big box, God. Box number two said Jesus. Then you had box number three that had me on it. And she was illustrating that I in Christ, Christ is in God. And then she said, the only way you will ever get me out of, of Christ is to get Christ out of God, which is utterly impossible. Amen? Then she did something that just blew my mind. Now, I, 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 when they started the video and they showed the box, and she popped open that lid and she pulled out the other box. The one big box said, God the Father. Then she opened box number two and it said, Jesus. Well, I kind of knew. You know, if you're halfway thinking and you're awake, you know the third box is going to say me. But here's what she did that just blew my mind. She opened that third box that said me and pulled out another box that said Jesus. Jesus is in me. You have God, Jesus is in God, I'm in Jesus, but because I'm a child of God, Jesus is in me. And I thought, wow, I like that. I like that. And because of that, that is where our security is. You are rich, you are an heir of God, and this morning, when I want you, when you walk out of here, after we have the final song and the final prayer, I want you to walk out of here with the thought that you are rich, you have blood bought by a royal, as a royal child of God, and you are blessed, and you are rich spiritually. You may not have a big checking account. You may not even have a checking account. You may not have a big savings account or a big savings account. But folks, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are blessed with every blessing that God has ever had. We just need to incorporate it into our lives and understand that we have them. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We pray, Father God, that you just remind us that we are rich in the Lord. Not in ourselves only, always, but we are rich in the Lord. And that as a child of God, that we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that, Father God, you have blessed us with all the blessings in the heavenly. And because of that relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord, through God the Father, we are his joint heirs. Father, I pray that you speak to hearts and that you just lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.